Well, brothers and sister brothers, <laughs> I wanted this episode to be special. I wanted episode 100 to be a milestone episode. But I just kept thinking what I was going to talk about and who was going to be in it. I've basically listened over 100 the podcast with that magic 100th episode number and how they celebrated it. And I was hit with FOMO. For those that don't know, fear of missing out. Let's rewind back to 10 episodes ago. 10 episodes ago, I was interviewing friends and wondering how this episode was going to be extra special. 10 episodes later, I took a break. A month ago, I took some time off from the podcast to focus on my mental health. Because I said I really needed it, and I didn't want anything to go down like it did last year. Oh, I'm good now. I also went to Texas for about a week. Met up with some awesome, great people. Mostly family, and got to finally visit the big Texan restaurant. That's right. The home of the 72-ounce steak challenge. As seen on the first season of Man vs. Food. I didn't partake in that challenge, although if this was like 10 years ago, I would have totally fucking demolished that shit. Yeah, I was down. I was down 10 years ago. Now I'm just like, I see what happened to Adam, the first man versus food, uh, season one person, and yeah, I'm good. (laughs) Uh, No way. Instead, I got this awesome boot for a drink, which I will be using and taking to get-togethers and barbecues to drink from. Oh yeah, got to put in some daddy juice in there. Speaking of the road trip, as soon as I got to Texas and woke up in a nice, fancy hotel. Not the Holiday Inn, but it was eh. I woke up to 5K downloads. Thanks for the love, even though I wasn't posting anything for about a few weeks. But it's good to know I still had listeners. The trip lasted for about a week or so. On the way back. Took a stop in Amarillo, Texas, home of the 72-ounce steak, and instead of taking the challenge, I settled for a (sighs) 20-ouncer. Maybe next time when I have my podcast equipment together, we can make a show out of it. I would love to fucking do that. 72-ounce, yeah. That would be the death of me. Um, But, you know, might as well do it on a podcast, right? Just... The where were his last words? It was oh my heart. It's on the podcast. <laughs> Just make sure to post it. <laughs> oh, producer, editor, whoever is gonna take over my job, make sure to post that. I want it to be put in the on Spotify and everything. Hit post before you die. There it is. <laughs> when I got home, I felt great. But I thought to myself, I need to get back to work, listened and binged to a bunch of podcasts on my way there and back, and I felt I needed something new for a change. It's still a wrestling podcast, but it's continuing to evolve. So yes, this is still not its final form. Just ask Eric. Welcome, everybody, to episode 100. If you are new here, I am your host, and you are listening to the 100th episode of From Under the Apron. If you listened to me before and are used to my cold, oversaturated intros, monologue, whatever, welcome back. Before I continue on with this episode, 
is going to be about. Let me just say, follow us on our socials and support us. From Under the Apron on Instagram, Spotify, and YouTube. Apron underscore stories on the Twitter. And support us now on the Patreon. Uh, join the Patreon. You can support us there. To the tier to be a part of. And at the end of every episode, I will shout you out. So please go to patreon.com forward slash from Under the Apron podcast. <laughs> Now, what are you expecting out of this 100th episode? Flashy and over the top? Eh, you know. I tried to schedule that. I checked to see if anybody was available, but it feels too last minute. So instead of doing an over the top episode like I plan on doing, I want to appreciate y'all. The audience. My audience. My listeners. Because why not? Holy shit, I'm about to be transparent on this episode, aren't I? Uh, get your Kleenex ready. It's time for that moment. <laughs> for this episode, I want to do it just the way I started. Chaotic. I wanted to post a link on every social media site and see who bit the bait and go on board. So here we are. The first half of the podcast, a little side quest, so to speak. I mentioned on the Patreon. Honestly, I wasn't expecting it to take it off when I created it. The same way I wasn't expecting this podcast to draw any numbers. But when I saw my email light up and read that I have a patron, I broke down. The person that did it doesn't know. The person that did it doesn't know that I broke down last night. But it happened. Okay, so first of all, I wasn't expecting this podcast to get any traction. I created it last year, first day of January of 2022 posted my first episode. A month before that happened, I was going through a bunch of things. My mental health wasn't good at all. It was all over the place. Um, that was the same year I got diabetes. I was working out a lot and trying to get it down, so I ghosted and left a bunch of socials in the dust just to clear my head, and in doing so, I found out about Anchor, which is now called Spotify for Podcasters. Hey, I'm a podcaster. I created the first episode of my wrestling podcast, Chaotic. It had no direction. It was just rough. Rough around the edges. Rough everywhere. Rough. Not that kind of rough, but rough. I just wanted some type of control of something, and it got me occupied watching shows that I love and talking about it. A few episodes later, I get a co-host, one of the most amazing people that I will ever know, and maybe he's listening right now, and if he is, Michael, not only are you one of my best friends, bud, you are my brother. You are my brother. Brother! I may have started this journey, but I couldn't have done some of it without you and your input. We put our heart and soul into this podcast, and we established that with our logo. True enough, we were told about twelve about the twelve episode curse. We beat it. We continued to put out episodes even though I thought it was going to end early at one point. But we kept on going. We added in another co host, Kashina Booker from Bodyslam.net. She provided her input and her post. She provided the female equivalent of a wrestling fan. Took a break from deliver after delivering 50 episodes, and that seems to be what I'm doing these days. I have over 100 episodes, and some of them are from podcasts I participated. Sort of like bonus episodes for y'all. But I never thought we would make it here to now. To me saying, welcome to episode 100. I'm still in shock. I have goosebumps. Goosies. 5K downloads? Come on. Over 45 countries being listened to worldwide? I still think it's not real how much, no matter how much I say it. Even the Patreon. In the words of legendary wrestler and Hall of Famer, the Iron Sheik, that makes me humbled. So, what now? Now, I get to work. Evolve. 
the evolution of my podcast from episode one to the future. We keep on going until there is nothing left for me to talk about. So, I came back from that road trip, fell asleep nearly all day, and then went straight to work. I wrote down episodes I wanted to do, TV show reviews, old premium live events, another match for the 8-hour tape segment. We're getting to summer, so why not do SummerSlam and some of my favorite matches? More predictions, get more results, and include more interviews with friends and new people that I just met. We are doing this. As for the Patreon, like I said earlier, same as the podcast. I wasn't expecting anyone to join it and support me. It was just something I wanted to do include. I got someone sending me messages to do a wrestling show review elsewhere. Why not just keep it all together? You decide what you want to pay, but the fact that I got that email last night, I broke down. There are amazing people out in this world. If you are authentic and nice to people, the universe will turn it around for you. And your friends will help you out. Maybe it's what I needed this year. I worked my ass off for an entire year and I set out goals and I almost hit and I'm almost at that 6k downloads goal in the middle of the year. So where do I go from here? Not to steal a catchphrase, but Cameron got Cameron Grimes who would go perfectly right here, brother. To the fucking moon. So sit back, relax, and take a cup of your favorite mommy or daddy juice. And listen to this episode for what it is. But first, here's some trailers. Movies and feelings. Pop Pop! Bring Your Own Popcorn is a podcast that dives into people and the movies who love them. Let us preach to your choir or stoke your ire as we spiral down memory lane with cult classics, Jurassics, and other genres that rhyme with traffic. What we lack in education, we make up for with comedy, compassion, and camaraderie. I'm your host, Mixtape Majesty, inviting you to join me and an assortment of wonderful guests on fine podcast apps everywhere. Bring Bring Your your Own popcorn. Popcorn! We finally have a date for the Season 2 premiere of Heels, exclusively airing on the Stars Network. One of the stars of the show, Stephen Amell, has revealed that the show Heels will be back on the air after a two-year hiatus on July 28th. <laughs> um, yeah, it kind of feels like when Cobra Kai had that two-year hiatus also. Hated that shit. I was a fan of it back in the YouTube when it was on YouTube only. And now they bring it to Netflix and people were on Netflix were like, Oh my god, you know, so I'm such a big fan. It's like, no. If you were such a big fan, you would have been like waiting just the same way I waited. But no, you're just a fan, Netflix fan. Because it just started there. So I figured why not bring back the backdrops and backlog segment and recap all eight episodes of the first season. Of course, of course, of course, just like we've done with the Rock's TV show Young Rock and No Holds Bar movie, I will include random information, or in this case, wrestling-related lingo. So let me tell you all what the show is about. Heels is about two brothers and rivals. One is a villain or heel in professional wrestling. The other a hero or a face to play out scripted matches as they war over their late father's wrestling promotion and vie for national attention in small town, Georgia. Heels was met with a highly positive response from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. The series has an approval rating of 96% based on reviews from 25 critics with an average rating of 8 out of 10. The critics' consensus reads, Quote, Stephen Amell and Alexander Ludwig sell hard in heels, an impressive new drama that has compelling angles on both sides of the rope. On Metacritic, the series has a weighted average score of 73 out of 100 based on reviews from 12 critics, indicating, quote, generally favorable reviews, end quote. 
The casting to the show is superb. Let me tell you who's in it. Steven Amell from Arrow series, you know, Green Arrow. Um, Oliver Queen. Yeah, that guy. He's amazing. He's awesome. Alexander Ludwig. Allison Luff. Mary McCormick. Chris Bauer. Mike O'Malley. Who is the executive producer and among many of the stars of the show? Um, remember that one guy in Glee? The, um, Kurt Hummel's father. I forgot his, uh, first name. Mr. Hummel. <laughs> but yeah, um, he just does a flipped out role on here, on heels. Like, totally different than what he was playing on Glee. Alright, so the first episode titled Kayfabe aired on August 15th of 2021. Kayfabe is a wrestling term for those that don't know. I don't want to get yelled at by the wrestling fans saying they already knew this. I know, but I'm also talking to the non-wrestling fans as well. Kayfabe is the act of maintaining that professional wrestling is a legitimate sport. Wrestlers that have practiced this sort of action were usually from the 80s. Hulk Hogan, Roddy Roddy Piper, and many more practice it. There's a story out there that Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheik were stopped by a car from drinking and smoking weed together when they were on the road, and they asked the cop to not share this information with anybody. Another wrestler that still practices to this day is the AEW World Heavyweight Champion, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, or MJF. MJF is a heavy on the kayfabe, and when he's signing autograph, he insults fans. He makes fun of them. He makes fun of a little girl for being in a wheelchair. Yeah, YouTube that. He's a fucking douchebag. The synopsis of the episode goes as follows. While the owner of Duffy Wrestling League, um, Jack Spade, played by uh, Stephen Amell, has full control of whatever happens to his fire inside the ring, he struggles to enjoy the same levels of freedom and power as he tries to balance his professional and personal lives. So the show starts off with Words on the screen telling us in the world of professional wrestling, the heroes are known as the faces and the villains are known as the heels. We cut to a montage of a rowdy crowd, locals, maybe a few hundred fans small enough to fit in the local venue watching a match while it cuts to someone typing on the computer to reveal that they're actually writing the match out. Jack Spade, played by former Arrow star Oliver Queen. Stephen Amell, who's also the writer of the match, typing how it's going to finish. He drags his opponent, Big Jim, to the center of the ring. Big Jim is played by Duke Davis Roberts, who's been on the peripheral Magnum P.I. and Justify to name a few. Uh, while all this is happening, the camera focuses on a red solo cup containing possibly beer being thrown into the first row where a woman is walking towards her son who is sitting in the front row. We find out that it's Jack Spade's wife, Stacy Spade, who is played by Allison Luff, who is the only one cheering for him. Luff has been on six episodes of New Amsterdam and also appeared on the hit TV show FBI. In 2014, she was cast as Fantine in the Broadway hit Les Miserables. Stacy hands her son Thomas a cup, a soda, water, maybe, I don't know, soda, pop, however you say it. Thomas is played by Roxanne Garcia, who has two other movies under his belt. A lot of people are cheering for Big Jim to finish off Jack Spade. Big Jim scoops up Jack over his shoulders, but... Jack wiggles out of it and reverses the hold onto a slam. Jack covers Big Jim for the one, two, three, and wins the match to a chorus of loud boos. Danny, the referee, hands Jack the championship belt and raises Jack's hand, but Jack, Jack doesn't want to be touched, so he throws the referee out of the ring and into Tony, the social media camera guy. Jack then grabs the microphone and yells at the crowd, Duffy, Georgia, my hometown. This place makes me sick. Yeah, it is. I have to do the accent. I apologize. If it, yeah, 
It, they're, that's the accent they're using. The crowd continues to boo, and it gets louder. Jack says, shut up. Did y'all think I was going to lose to Big Jim? Because if y'all did, then y'all dumber than you look. And that's saying something. The lights go out, and the spotlight shines into the entrance. Run to the Lightning by Coincidental Miners plays. Love every day. Big, tall, muscular Viking man known as Ace Bate, Jack's brother, runs out and hops into the ring to fight. Jack runs at Ace for a close line, but he ducks it, and Jack gets in the face with a super kick. Of course, a super kick. Jack gets back up and his close line out of the ring, while Ace celebrates in the ring with his valet, girlfriend, Crystal Tyler. Alright, sidebar, or side quest. Whatever. Ace is played by Alexander Ludwig, most famous for his role in The Hunger Games, or Bad Boys for Life, and most recently, Jorn Lothbrook on Vikings. Crystal is played by Kelly Berglund, who has appeared in past Disney TV shows, and as well as a few episodes on the hit drama Animal Kingdom. Most recently, she's been on The Goldbergs. Back to the story. Ace and Crystal celebrate a little way too much, perhaps, in the ring in front of this crowd with kids in it. Kind of like that rated R celebration that he had with Wrestler Edge a few decades ago with Lita. Yeah, y'all remember that. Stacy covers Tom's eyes because he's too young to watch his uncle get lucky in the middle of the ring. Jack Spade takes his championship belt to the back, and as the music dwindles down, Ace has the mic in his hand Calling his brother out. He said, Where are you going, big brother? Why don't we settle this right here tonight? Yeah, that's the accent they had. Uh, I'm sorry again. I, 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 I have to imitate it. I have to. Uh, the crowd erupts with cheers. Jack gets handed a microphone as well in ACLs. That's my best friend. You disrespected. These are my people you're insulting. And that? That's my belt you're wearing. Jack yells back, You ain't never gonna wear this belt, boy. And leaves towards the back. That was the most ridiculous. Wow. For whatever. Ace says, Look at you backing out and turning tail. Dad would be ashamed. He actually says daddy, but I'm not. <laughs> it's like the way he says it. Daddy would be ashamed. Why are you calling him daddy, Ace? You're like a. 30-year-old man. Then again, I've been calling this drink Daddy Juice, so I shouldn't say anything. Jack turns around and yells into his mic, addressing the crowd. Y'all want to see which Bay brother is really the king? The crowd cheers, thinking they're going to get another Jack Spade match that night. But Jack answers their question anyway. Then I guess you'll have to be back here next week. He baited them. <laughs> he turns to look at his brother. That's right. One week from tonight, you and me in the main event. Ace, I don't know why he says this, but Ace picks up the mic and says, Any time, any place. Jack returns with, I just told you the time and place, stupid. You want this belt? You come and get it. And, you know, why would he... Yeah. A raises his mic to his lips and gets Jack's attention and then says, Fuck you. <laughs> and proceeds to drop the mic. He breaks the mic. The crowd once again erupts with cheers. Run to the lightning place again. A celebrates by climbing the turnbuckle to show love to the fans. Well, Jack, Jack goes to the back where all the local wrestlers are sitting in gorilla position, clapping their hands and cheering for a segment. Well done. Yeah, we're exposing we're exposing the business with this show. So you know, um, 
Before I continue, Gorilla Position got its name from right when Gorilla Monsoon retired from angering competition, transitioned into on-screen commentator, and was a backstage agent. One of the Gorilla's jobs backstage in most of the 80s was that he sat at the table right behind the curtain, and he was the guy that told the guys, you have X amount of minutes. Remember, you're going over with your finish. If you need more time, I can give you five extra minutes. And if you're not done by then, I'm coming to that ring, and I'm ending the match myself. Fucking Gorilla Monsoon, brother. Gorilla had a monitor and a pencil, a clipboard, and a stopwatch. Guys would go out. Gorilla would start the stopwatch. Watch the match. Match ends, and Gorilla writes down the time the match ended. Kind of like what I do when I go check out the Wikipedia. What time they start, what time it ends, all that stuff. Back to the show. Jack shakes Big Jim's hand and then gets told by Willie Day, the audio technician slash producer slash assistant. Person of many name tags. Played by Mary McCormick to tell Ace to stop breaking those goddamn mics. McCormick here is played by U.S. Marshal. McCormick played U.S. Marshal Mary Shannon from 2008 through 2012 in the hit TV show In Plain Sight. Mics are pretty expensive these days. Jack tells Willie the fog machine broke also. And the bad news keep piling up. Tony, the social media camera guy, tells Jack the camera broke when he threw Danny, the referee, onto him. Jack asks them if they're okay, and they say yes, and he tells them they need new cameras anyway, which he will have to buy. Ace and his girl Crystal finally get backstage celebrating, kissing again, and celebrating the huge pop he just got with everyone else who's cheering for them. But Jack seems disappointed when he hands Ace a can of beer. Ace asks if he's mad that he said the F word. Jack tells them they have kids that come to the show, including his. Ace tells Jack that he was just being himself. Jack gets in his face and tells him that when he's in the ring, he sticks to his scripts. Ace stares at Jack, but gets distracted by the sound of the crowd yelling his name. And then we get to the intro to the show, complete with theme music titled Love and War by Jack Gardani. I'm not waiting for the answer I will walk in the shore to find you to find the peace that you're Hi, everyone. This is JJ, the co-founder of Good Pods. If you haven't heard of it yet, Good Pods is like Goodreads or Instagram, but for podcasts. It's new, it's social, it's different, and it's growing really fast. There are more than 2 million podcasts, and we know that it is impossible to figure out what to listen to. On Good Pods, you follow your friends and podcasters to see what they like. That is the number one way to discover new shows and episodes. You can find Good Pods on the web or download the app. Happy listening! The next scene is Jack doing his morning run out in the field, and it looks like Duffy is a small town. He passes by an old billboard of the Duffy Wrestling League that is advertising an old match. Wild Bill Hancock against Tom King Spade in a ladder match part three for the DWL Championship. Next, we get into Thomas' room. He has a picture signed by his favorite wrestler on the wall. His Uncle Ace. (laughs) Not his dad, no. He's a fucking heel. His Uncle Ace is a face. On the other side of the wall is a poster for an old show that has his grandfather's name on it. Advertising for the show that Jack just saw while he was on his run. Stacy wakes up Thomas from sleeping and tells him it's time to go to church. Thomas asks if his dad is coming this time, to which Stacy says that his dad has a lot going on right now. Jack gets home from his run 
drinks a cup of water, and gets to work on editing the DWL website homepage. The banner reads, Spade versus Spade. Tickets are sold out. He closes that window to reveal the draft script of his match against his brother that hasn't been written yet. He's a last-minute guy, just like I am. We procrastinate and don't get anything done until the last minute, so he'll probably be end up writing the match hours before the show starts. Stacy heads downstairs, ready to go to church, and asks Jack if they're leaving separate or together. Jack tells her to go ahead. He still has to take a shower. Stacy has that powerful wife stance, hands on her hip, disappointed that Jack is not coming to church as a family because he used that excuse last week. Jack says that last week he fell asleep and wasn't deliberate. Stacy tells Jack that she sang great. She's in the choir and Jack didn't even hear her sing. He asks if she's making him feel guilty for not coming to church. Jack gets up and tells her he will wash up then. Stacy tells him to think of this as some time with the family and that Thomas heard them fighting the night before. Jack is confused. He says, that wasn't fighting. That was loving with raised voices. And if our boy's going to get hitched one day, he has to learn a few things like raised voices and church guilt. Stacy has in uh, four expensive fog machines that showed up out of nowhere. Jack tells her that they're expensive and durable and good enough for a wrestling show. It's theater. They need four good fog machines for the dome because it's a big place. His dad has shitty broken down fog machines and he wants to invest in his future with things that actually work. Stacy asks him that if he had told her that their investment strategy included four fog machines, that she could have done a quick search on a half dozen websites that could have shipped these same four fog machines for substantially less dollars than what he purchased for. Jack smiles and says, Stacy makes a great point, don't they all? Stacy shows Jack an envelope filled with coupons that she clips every week so they can, can stretch their dollars and just spend smart and they can spend it on the family and buy little Thomas a baseball bat or once a month watching a movie at the theater instead of at a red box. Jack tells her that movies are shit nowadays. Stacy says they don't have to watch the movie. They can make out like they used to when they were young. Jack reminds her of that one time they watched North by Northwest Desado and she wore that cute green dress with nothing underneath. Stacy tells him to hush and reminds him that they both decided she should stay home while Tom is in school, but she really wants to look for a job. Jack tells her that his mother never had a job and he doesn't want Stacy to have to want to have a while on a job. He does. I don't even know how he said it. He said doesn't want to... I don't want you to want to have a job, something like that. Stacy tells him that if he keeps buying four fog machines without consulting all penny pincher here, then they're not going to have a choice. She kisses him seductively, and he says that's not fair that she put sex on his mind before church. How dare she? Stacy says that after church they can go watch a movie and she can leave her underwear in the car. She turns around, twicks on him, and walks away. He stops her and tells her that he hasn't finished the script and asks who should win. Stacy tells Jack, us, them too, his family. She tells him to hurry up. She'll be in the car. The next scene is a montage scene of the small town of Duffy, Georgia. The local, the small businesses, the scenery, the grass, the roads, everything about it is so fucking beautiful. We finally get to the church where the Spade family meets up with Grandma Carol Spade, who was played here by Alice Barnett. Alice Barrett who's been on 455 episodes of the soap Another World that ran from 1989 to 1999. Grandma Carol calls Thomas her favorite grandson. And Jack tells her that her favorite son is here too. Carol asks where Jack, where's her other favorite son? Ace. And he says he doesn't know. Carol says that Ace told her that he was staying at Jack's place. Jack asks Daisy, what room did Ace day in, to which she doesn't want anything from this, and says she's late for church and leaves. Next scene, we see Ace pissing on a tree with Big Jim and his wife, Melanie, played by Erica Papas, waiting in the truck. Melanie asks, why doesn't Ace piss on the other side of the tree where nobody can see him instead of doing it right in front of them? 
Big Jim says Ace is just a showman. They both get out of the truck and Big Jim yells at Ace. Why doesn't he just use the bathroom inside the church? He just pissed on God's property. Ace tells him to put it right next to the pulpit and you can hear it flush so he's trying to be respectful. If God didn't want him pissing, he shouldn't have made him to need to piss. Ace, Jimmy, Melanie, Kitchen all show up inside the church and sit down while Stacy is singing Call On Me. Let's get back to Allison Luff, who is a great singer. I mentioned her being in Les Miserables. Les Mis. Wanted to look her up also, and she's a musical theater actress based in New York City and most well known for her role as Alfaba in the first U.S. National Tour of Wicked from April 30th, 2013 to April 20th, 2014, and as Miss Honey from 2014 to 2015 in Matilda the Musical at the Schubert Theater. Next scene outside of church, Big Jim tells Mama Carol and Ace that Stacy sang great. Carol tells him that liturgy is not a performance and the new pastor can't no more preach than a cat. Ace jumps in with at least he made it right, which excites Carol and tells Ace that him and his brother need to be good tonight. The world needs love right now. Ace says to tell that to Jack, he writes the script. Thomas shows up and he hugs his uncle. Ace Ask him if he's coming to a show tonight. He can't miss it. He wants to see his biggest and best fan in the front row. If he's in the crowd cheering him on, he knows he's good. Melanie asks where Jack is, and Stacy tells her he's in his Jeep. He doesn't like being seen in public before a show, especially not with Ace around. Melanie asks if that's kayfabe. Big Jim says yes with a fucking big ass grin on his face. So proud of his wife for knowing that word. Ace tells them that Jack has to keep up the act all the time, even if it's outside the ring, even if it's at church, so people know it's real. Carol chimes in with protecting the business, and she begins to tell a story of when their father broke his leg during a match. He rolled around in a wheelchair for over a month, so the boys would think it really happened. Melanie then asks. If people know if it's fake, right? Everyone stops what they're doing. Melanie did the unsinkable and said the F word. Ace had that I know you didn't just say that in front of my mama look. Stacy had that oh sweetie look on her face. Big Jim is smiling at the whole situation. I don't think he's all there anymore. He's just like, <laughs> my wife just said it's fake. Uh, Carol tells her never to say fake. She's a wrestling wife now. Stacy says, yes, they know. Melanie asks, if they know, then what's the point? Oh my god. Carol's disturbed by this and yells at Jimmy, how did this man get you pregnant? And he still hasn't let you know this. Jimmy tells Carol that they were doing more important things like protect, practicing getting pregnant. Mama Carol's an old-fashioned woman, so Ace has to tell her that and explain to her that they were having intercourse. Mama Carol is shocked. <gasps> How dare they? In God's uh, house. Stacy and Melody walk away and Stacy explains to Melody that the crowd believing one is good and one is bad makes the audience part of the show. Melody says it's ridiculous. For real? What the fuck, Melody? I don't like her already. How did Big Jim get this girl married and pregnant and still think it's fake? Melody tells Stacy every time Jim Russell is scarce of his death and doesn't know how Stacy does it, to which Stacy responds with K Fabe. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa. And I'm Dawn. And if you've ever watched a TV show and thought to yourself, oh my god, that season finale plot twist was absolutely bonkers. Or seen a movie and thought, wow, I need to talk to somebody about this train wreck immediately. Then we think you'll fit right in with our podcast, I Hate It, Let's Watch It. We watch TV shows like Riverdale and Emily in Paris. And movies like Deep Water, Killer Sofa, Rubber, and Deadly Illusions. And we give them the total rinse they deserve. It's basically group therapy for movie masochists. So come check us out wherever you stream podcasts. Next scene, we're introduced to the outside of Dome with the wrestlers train, like a rundown warehouse, but it's actually a gym inside. Crystal arrives in her Jeep and smiles as she goes inside with a new guy, Bobby Pin, played by Trey Trucker, is introduced to the establishment and the local wrestlers that also fix the ring. Bobby asks if they ever sell out, but Apocalypse, played by former Pittsburgh Steelers, 
linebacker James Harrison Jr. tells them that they used to do back in the day, but now the shit is all dried up. But Jack bringing Ace on is sure to be working. Rooster Robbins, played by Alan Maldonado, says he's been at this thing since he was 18. Maldonado is one of those actors. If you see his face, then you would know who he was. Also, a voice actor who's worked on the rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as Tim Duckman. Played Bobby on The Last OG with Tracy Morgan and Tiffany Haddish. Rooster says he's torn his ACL, MCL, PCL, or every other letter in the alphabet. But in every show, he puts on a five-star match. Ace doesn't have a scratch on him, but he's the one in the main event. And not him? Apocalypse tells him to quit already, but Rooster says that the DWL needs him. They can't strive. They can't strive without Rooster. Rooster tells Bobby Pin to stand in the middle of the ring. Rooster goes to the top rope, hits a moonsault on Bobby, who seems to be laughing. Rooster asks him, why the hell are you laughing and not selling? And Bobby being green says, there isn't anybody here, right? It's an empty arena right now. Rooster tells Bobby they're practicing and the crowd's supposed to believe that it hurt. It doesn't matter if nobody's here, you sell. Rooster orders Bobby to get to the top rope and hit an elbow fly, drop from the top rope on Rooster. Rooster lays down in the middle of the ring, but Apocalypse questions if he, sh- if he even should think that Bobby is new. Like, new, new. Green knew. Bobby goes to the top rope, takes his time, does a little breathing exercise. <sighs> he jumps, comes down, knocks Rooster's wind out of him. Bobby apologizes, but then thinks that Rooster is selling the pain. But Rooster assures him that he hurt him. Bobby asks what he did wrong, and Crystal, who's been watching from the bleachers, tells Bobby that he let his weight come down. On his elbow, he got to bring down on. He got to bring down on his leg, and let his arm hang loose when he hits Rooster. Rooster tells Bobby that's wrestling one on one, and what type of deep fake shit did he send to Jack to let him come train here? Tell us why. Tell us the reason why. In the back, Willie's watching an ad from Florida this wrestling dystopia, which pretty much features old wrestling clips from the old TNA. Footage of Abyss pouring thumbtacks in the ring, fighting with Raven and Samoa Joe, as well as explosive graphics. And then we see the owner of Florida wrestling dystopia, Charlie Gully, played here by Mike O'Malley, yelling at the screen, saying that the DLL is done. The dystopia is the new breed, and that he is God. Willie turns the phone off and walks away, feeling annoyed. She meets up with Jack, who is staring at the wall of champions, former DWL champions, that includes his father, Wild Bill Hancock himself, and others. Willie asks if she should make room for Ace, and Jack questions who she even win it. Willie says Ace is the reason they got a full house tonight. Show business 101. Keep the shiny star happy. They walk towards Jack's office, and he says the outcome will be in the best interest of the overall narrative. Willie asks whose narrative? They walk into Jack's office, and the problems continue to pile up. They might have to get a new ref. Then he hurt his ankle when he was thrown out of that ring, and that this isn't worth the lousy pay that he gets paid. She tells Jack about the rival company shedding on them once again. Jack says Charlie Gully is a hack and thinks he invented the idea of guys bleeding in the ring. They don't even wrestle, wrestle. They just stage car crashes. Willie reminds Jack that people like to stop and look during car crashes. And Jack tells her that they, then they drive away. Jack calls Charlie a Yankee dick shitting plastic fishworm peddler. <laughs> what the fuck is that? And says that he woke up one day and thought he was Vince McMahon. They got nothing that DWL don't. Willie tells Jack, except for the fans, and a good establishment... She reminds him that the roof is leaking and he doesn't, if he doesn't give the boys money, they're going to start heading out to the greener pastures. They've been building up Ace versus Jack forever now and after tonight, what are they going to do to have that crowd keep coming back? Jack tells Willie his match with Big Jim got 10k views online. They got heat like the DWL and has since his dad versus Wild Bill, but they need to upgrade their shit and they need nice cameras. Willie ironically says Stacy's going to love that. 
Jack says, what's good for the DWO is good for Stacy. He drinks his beer and gets to work while Willie asks if he thinks his dad would have wanted, who would have wanted to, who he thinks his dad would have wanted to win. Jack says it doesn't matter. He's dead. Next scene, Quirk's Corner Convenience Store. Big Jim is with Ace shopping for a Gatorade in his hand. Ace tells Jim that tonight is sold out because of him and he only got 50 bucks and he doesn't want to go back to Winn-Dixie because that's where he got fired. Tomorrow when he's champion, he's demanding $100 a show. Jim asks if he's sure he's winning tonight. Ace tells Jim he stuffed Trisha Bell last night. Calls her a thirsty angel and says that might be time for a new valet and Crystal has a pointless job anyway. Ace puts his Gatorade account and Jim pays for it. L. Helen, the store clerk, tells Big Jim good luck in his match tonight. And as they walk away, she also tells Ace to put the gum back. He steals shit every time he comes to the store. The only reason he hasn't called the cops... He steals shit every time he comes to the store. The only reason she hasn't called the cops yet is because his father was good to her family. Ace walks over to put her gum on the counter and walks away. But Helen decides to continue by saying Tom would be ashamed. Ace stops dead in his tracks, turns around to stare at Helen in her face, and proceeds to go in on her. Ace leans on the counter to make sure she's looking right at him and says, Hey, Helen. You remember that one time we were kids and y'all came over to the house for supper? I do. I just had to sit there and listen to you talk and eat, talk and eat. Man, did you eat. Scoop after scoop after scoop of casserole. I thought for sure you'd bust. You just kept on talking all night long about your little puppy dog that you found on the side of the road. Do you remember that? Jimmy tries to stop Ace. But Ace continues, about a week later, Mom told us that Dog got loose and got hit by a car. You know what old Tom said? Probably for the best. That Cooper girl would have probably ate it anyway. God damn, did we laugh. He takes the gum from the counter and leaves the store, leaving Helen in tears as well as Jim, who feels bad that he just witnessed that. Never meet your idols. Back in the office... Jack still hasn't written the script. Instead, he's watching the ending of last week's show, where Ace close line Jack out of the ring. He gets a phone call, and Jack answers it. It's Mr. Cooper. In the locker room, Apocalypse and Rooster are still teaching the new kid, Bobby Penn, the ins and outs of wrestling. Apocalypse says it's not about winning or losing. It's about getting over with the crowd. Your job as you go through matches, whatever the outcome is, either you make him love you or you make him love hating you. Diego Cottonmouth, played by Robbie Ramos, tells Bobby that he started out as the Venus Menace since he figured nobody in Georgia wanted to cheer for a Cuban and he looked Italian anyway. Rooster tells him that no he doesn't. <laughs> Diego continues, the fans don't bite. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. Apocalypse interrupts with because he don't look Italian. Diego continues, then one night, King Spade comes up to me and hands me this yellow mask and tells me I'm a Mexican luchador, Diego Cottonmouth. Now the fans can't stand me, especially since I'm here legally, which I love reminding them. Crystal waits outside the locker room and asks Willie if she could use a locker room. Willie reminds Crystal that she's been there for two months. The locker rooms are only for the wrestlers. Willie goes inside the locker room and tells those assholes to hustle up to get in the ring because Jack wants to get over the show tonight. Jack reads the script, tells Rooster he's going over on Bobby Penn. Bobby speaks up and tells Jack that he had an idea, but Willie interrupts and shuts him down, saying to keep his ideas in his head and out of his mouth. The roster laughs. Jack continues. Apocalypse goes over on Diego. Feel free to use the USA chant. The Goblin Boys go over. over. The Goblin Boys going over on Rude Boy. We don't get to see who those are. After the mission, everyone comes back with about a royal. Big Jim and Ace finally arrive as Jack stares at Ace. He tells Apocalypse and Big Jim their last two standing. Just when the crowd thinks Apocalypse got him, get the crowd in his favor to chant Big Jim and throw Apocalypse out. Jack and Ace are going to bring it home and Ace goes down with the pinfall. Ace is disappointed with this and puts his head down in shame. Everyone's confused by this as well.
You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. Mama Murdered a Podcast is a podcast where me, the mama, will be killing it on the podcast. We're taking a deep dive into things that are hard to talk about and even harder to believe that these things actually happen in the world that we live in. This entire podcast will be a trigger warning. I'll be talking about triggering topics while I dive headfirst into a lot of the cases that I'll be covering. New episodes will be released every week on Wednesdays because... Well, because nobody likes Mondays and because Fridays are for day drinking and barbecues. Some of the case topics will be murder, of course, serial killers like Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, missing persons cases like five-year-old Summer Wells who vanished from her own yard in broad daylight in the middle of June in Tennessee in 2021, and especially the ones where it kind of seems like they just vanished into thin air, like Brian Schaefer. He walked into a bar, but he never walked out. He's still never been seen again. I'll also be covering cold cases and lesser known cases. Join me every Wednesday to talk about all things tragic, murder, and things that happen in the downtown right ugliest sides of society. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, you can rate me on Spotify. You can also leave a review and rating on Apple Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at murdered underscore mama. All of these things are free and they only take about a second to do and it really does help grow the podcast. If you have any case suggestions, please send them my way. You can send them to the email address mamamurderedapodcast at gmail.com. Outside, Jack and Ace are arguing over the finish. Ace tells Jack, why not just not wrestle at all? Jack says he'll just put Big Jim over in the main event. The Big Freak is the main attraction and the crowd loves him. Ace asks why he is doing this. Jack explains to Ace about the Charlie Gully dystopia situation. He has to subvert expectations, keep the fan base interested and engaged. Which means if Ace beats Jack tonight, then what do they do then? But if they see their hero lose to the villain, they get to watch their hero fight his way back up to the top. Then that's something. That's an angle. Ace tells Jack people are coming to watch him win tonight. Jack tells him that people are coming because they trust him to tell a better story than what they have to live with every day. Ace tells Jack that as grown men in costumes pretending to hit each other is supposed to be fun. Jack says, not the expense of being good. Then he dropped the bomb. Marty Cooper called Jack earlier and told him that Helen went home crying. What the fuck is wrong with you? He is disgusted and walks away. Ace asks if that's why he's losing because he defended himself against Helen Cooper. Defended himself, huh? Jack yells in town on match day. You don't do that shit. People need to believe you're a good guy. Ace says they do because he is. Jack stares at Ace and drives away. Ace goes to the locker room, obviously upset at the whole situation. Crystal walks in and says, it's just a belt. Ace looks at Crystal annoyed, sits down and asks her, how does it happen? How does the match end? Crystal reads the script. It's a half-hour match. Then Ace super kicks Jack, but instead of pinning him, Ace trots around the ring playing to the crowd. When Ace finally goes for the pin, Jack hits an inside cradle for the win. That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Ace gets up and says he could write a better match than that. I could write a better match than that. What? Dad just leaves this all to him and I'm just stuck. Crystal tells Ace she's been watching matches here since she was little. Sometimes losing is the best way to win over a crowd. She tells Ace and reminds him she was at his last football game where he threw the kick to lose in overtime. She was 15 and even though she knew who Ace was because he was King Spade's kid, there was something about seeing him in the field alone, crying. But that's all right, because it made her feel for him. And that's when she knew that one day, somehow, she was going to put on a spandex leotard and hit someone with a chair just for him. They both laugh. Ace reminds her that he wasn't crying. They laugh again. And then they have sex in the locker room. <laughs> Diego tries to not interrupt them because they are having sex on top of his yellow mask. But they don't care. Diego rips the mask away from them and walks away. Next scene, Jack comes back from driving all over town and walks into the dome. Willie sitting on the bleachers to the staff putting out food. Willie takes Jack to the training area and tells him they have a visitor. In the back is Wild Bill Hancock telling stories of his past to the rest of the boys. Wild Bill is played by Chris Bauer who eyes Jack and calls him the nastiest heel he ever saw. Just like that. That was his accent. Jack says he learned from the best. Wild Bill says he was the best because he had Tom. Sort of like Jack and Ace. 
Too bad there isn't a ladder involved. Jack tells Wild Bill that it was him and his dad's thing, but Wild Bill tells him that it killed. Those matches made his career. It's how he got discovered and left Duffy. He says, speaking of being rich, he made sure everyone got some barbecue for tonight. Wild Bill goes up to Jack's office with Willie and says, this brings back memories. Wild Bill asks Jack how the business is going. Jack says, it's good. It's good. Wild Bill says he did his time in Duffy. Jack asks, why is he there? Wild Bill says, he's here for Ace. Suits from up north sent him to scout him. It's early in the process, but he could go up to developmental. But they think he can succeed at the highest level. <laughs> it sounds like Chet from uh, Boy Meets World. Hope it's been added. Uh, it's early in the process, but he's going to the highest level. Jack reminds Wild Bill that Ace is just a kid. He hasn't mastered his level yet. Wild Bill says he pops the crowd already. He's a natural. It's in his blood. Jack yells that Wild Bill has never seen him wrestle. Wild Bill says he has, and through the powers that be, thanks to Jack and all those videos he posts online. Jack says he's not going to leave what they built. Wild Bill says that he left and he just came back on a Lear jet. How did that work out? Jet, limo, sold out stadium. Woo! He asked Jack what he's trying to resurrect here. Anyways, Jack says he's loved his dad, but he didn't know how to grow or how to evolve, and he surely doesn't want to. He's getting DWL out there, and people are responding to the storyline and the characters because he's pretty good at making sure they care. Wild Bill asked Jack if he believed that this new DWL can be better competition. Didn't they do a show at the Golden Corral Buffet a few months back? Oh boy. Right in the fucking heart right there. Jack's eyes widen up and says, Listen, Bill, I get it. You made your choice. You did your thing. You went up north and you made yourself a career. Got to hold a world championship belt above your head on national TV. But just because people know how you are, know you here. But just because people know you here, just because your picture is on the fucking wall, don't mean you get to come back here and patronize. Just because you got more don't mean we got any less. Just because you got more don't mean we got any less. That should be on a fucking shirt. That should be a fucking model right there. For real. Wild Bill tells Jack that his dad built a cathedral to a local pastime. It's a community theater. It's a hobby. One of your own guys, your blood, leaving for the real thing. You should be proud of that. Because it's honestly the best you can do. Jack has enough of it and tells Bill to get the fuck out of his building. His office. Bill leaves and get gets on the computer to try and change stuff around for tonight, but he hears commotion outside. Wild Bill telling Ace he was sent here to scout him. Ace is excited for this opportunity, and Jack is upset. Next scene, we see a montage of the town of Duffy clearing, closing their stores earlier than usual because it's wrestling town. They want to go watch their wrestling people. You got fans with the DWL banner on their trucks, Posters all over the town. People beeping at the road at people who are still on the road. Hey, you got to get out of here. Let's go watch this wrestling. Bookier than thou. Welcome in. Back in the dome in the training area. Ace is going through his match with Jack. A new ending. He thinks just because Wild Bill was sent to scout him, he is going to change the outcome of the match. Ace explains how the match should go. He goes to the top, turnbuckle, does a moonsault, bam. Jack catches him in the midair and slams him on the mat, bam. Everybody thinks Ace is done, but he gets back up, kicks out. They both get up, start trading punches, uh, uh, uh. Ace super kicks, Jack goes down, bam. He lets Jack get back up again, and bam, another super kick. Hey, that's how he explained it. I'm just imitating the whole thing. So he's basically doing a super kick party for to Jack, the poor guy. Jack looks at him. Ask, that's it? Crystal says, no, there's more. Ace then tries to add in more. Uh, uh, Ace says he doesn't pin Jack after the super kick because he doesn't want the match in uh, just yet. No, not yet. Jack slowly gets up. 
Ace hits him again for the ah uh, for the pin. One, two, Jack kicks out. He gets back up one more time. Ace says, and you look at me, and I look at you, and we look at each other, and we smile because we're both brothers. We shake hands, and then BAM! Another super kick. It's a super kick party. They love super kick parties over here. Pin for the win. The, he imitates a crowd reaction. Ah! Ah! But really, he sounds like a screeching cat. Ah! <laughs> I don't know how to screeching cat sounds like. Jack turns around to look at Willie, who says she doesn't hate it. Crystal tells Jack if they play right, it'll put the crowd more over on him and to his side. Jack is annoyed and asks what her name is again. Cheryl? Crystal. Crystal, what makes her think that he wants to be good with the fans? He's a heel. He doesn't give a shit. Come on. What? Come over my side. No, he doesn't care. Crystal says that nobody would expect it. Ace says that this, this is good. It's exciting. Jack asks Big Jim what he thinks. Big Jim says, it feels like the end of something. Jack says it does feel like the end of something. Like, like a conclusion. Ace took, tells Jack if Wild Bill sees what he can do in the ring, then he's gone. Jack says to finish this same, if he wants the time, if he wants the title belt, he needs to stick around and earn it, just like everybody else. Ace is upset again and tells Jack everyone else is happy for him. Jack tells Ace that everybody's opinion don't matter to him. Everyone leaves. Jack consults with Willie. Even if Ace leaves, the little yell still got him and still got Big Jim. Willie tells Jack to say it again like he means it. What is up? This is Fuck It, Let's Talk with your host, Christine. Monthly, I'll be here to discuss the ups and woes of parenting and explore topics with other parents or not parents in hopes of finding a little sanity. Just a warning, the keyword here is puke. Eventually, you'll get it. So come join me where we explore honest takes on parenting and life. Don't forget to follow on Spotify or subscribe wherever else the podcast is available. Be sure to check out the polls on Anchor, where you can also show some support if it tickles your fancy. And if you want more, head on over to the newsletter, F It Let's Talk on WordPress. I look forward to curse chatting with you. Fuck it. Let's talk. Next few things are town of Duffy arriving at the dome and tailgating the parking lot, waiting on the show to start. Footage of Jack editing his match against Ace, deleting everything he wrote down earlier and starting over. While Bill takes Ace with him and he starts to knife a 4x4 wooden board, which reminds me of Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Ace asks Wild Bill if he needs to him to do anything. Wild Bill says to do his thing, tell the story, and maybe they can find him a better looking valet. This is Ace's shot. Ace tells Wild Bill to tell her to tell that to Jack. This is his ring, his script. Wild Bill tells Ace that Jack is a know it all who doesn't know anything who clings to these rigged scripts. If Jack was half as smart as he was, he would see that this isn't his show. If Jack was half as smart as he was, he would see that this isn't how it works and it's about being adaptable. Eight says, wrong word, wrong guy. Wild Bill asks if he hates his brother. Ace says they're different. Wild Bill says, tale as old as time. Brother sparring, Cain and Abel, like Jake and Esau. Ace says he doesn't know the last two. Wild Bill stares at him. Says his mother would slap him silly. <laughs> Jacob stole his brother's Esau's birthright. And Ace asked the guy that took the ladder to heaven. Oh my God. Wild Bill says, there you go. <laughs> Shit. Was never meant to be good between them. 
It was foreshadowed. Read your Genesis. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the other shall serve the younger. Ace asked, Whose bowels? Oh my God, these fucking people are ridiculously stupid. Let's go. <laughs> While Bill answers with their fucking mother's Rebecca. <laughs> Ace says, you know the... You know the Bible really well. Wild Bill says you would too if you got hit by one for 17 years. Wild Bill walks over to his jeep and presents Ace with his present. The wooden 4x4 four four with the words, Long live the king, etched on it. King Spade, Jack Spade, Ace Spade. Tom loved that stupid shit. Ace starts to tell a story, but Wild Bill stops him and tells him not to tell him a depressing story about Tom. Ace says that Jack is always trying to protect him. Thinks he still has to. Wild Bill says Jack is trying to keep him under his thumb, to keep him from getting what's his, to keep him from the belt. He tells Ace he needs to send him a message. Baby brother's on charge now. Ace suggests he can skip autographs. Wild Bill says that back in the days, if someone got a line, Tom and him would make sure one or two punches landed for real. That's the shit he likes to see. He walks towards Ace and tells him that Jacob had the gut to wrestle with God. How about you? Back in the parking lot, the wrestlers are signing autographs. Apocalypse is doing push-ups while the kid is on his back. Rooster's doing taking pictures with the fans. Diego has his mask on, and girls are taking selfies with the new guy, Bobby Penn. And then we come up to Ace's table, and right in front of the line is Thomas, who is waiting for his uncle while Stacy looks on worried. Next scene, Jack climbs the water tower where he finds Big Jim sitting down and joins the view of the lightning bugs. Jack starts to tell Big Jim a story about his mother who wouldn't let him come to watch the shows. Here. <clears throat> Jack tells... Jack starts to tell Big Jim a story about his mother who wouldn't let him come to watch the shows here when he was young. But Tom Spay would have his buddies over to watch old WWE pay-per-views and analyze what worked and what didn't. He would sneak out of his room. He got to watch Ric Flair with Sting for the World Championship. His mom caught him and made him go back to sleep, but he caught it the next day. He says that Flair got cocky and Sting hit him with the inside cradle and got the one, two, three. The crowd cheered so loud the arena was shaking, but the crazy thing was the first thing that Sting did was grab a microphone and said Ric Flair is the greatest world champion of all time. This, these people didn't know what to do because they were supposed to be mortal enemies. But the stinger broke kayfabe just to give Flair credit because he knew people only loved the good guy as much as they hated the bad guy. Before I even say another word as to what happened, <laughs> I had to look this up. It's true. It happened in 1990 and that's the great American bash. Rick Flair was going for the figure four leg lock, not because he was being cocky, but because he was going to go for his move. He was trying to finish the fight. He locks the leg, but Sting reverses it and inside cradle for the three count and wins the match in the world championship. The first thing he did was go towards the entrance way where he was being celebrated by the Junkyard Dog and the Steiner Brothers, as well as the Gordon Sully, who had an interview with the world champion, and this is what Sting had to say. Congratulations, Sting. My mouth is really dry, so try and understand what I'm going to say. Ric Flair is the greatest world champion of all time. Me, on the other hand, I'm a champion tonight and tonight only. I've got some big shoes to fill in Ric Flair's shoes. Although we may have our differences, all I have to say is I'm going to do the best that I can do. And that's it. This has... This has to be the happiest moment of your life, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Ric Flair wasn't champion six times with the help of the horseman every time. He's truly a great champion. I know you don't want to hear it, maybe some of you, but it's true. It's a big accomplishment for the Stinger in his short career. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Okay, thank you, Stinger. Big Jim smiles and says, do you want me to turn heel? Jack says, yes, sir, and explains how the match is going to go. I'm out cold and about to get pinned, right? 
you run down, you deck the ref, and you choke slam ace because you're just jealous. You're done playing second fiddle. You beat the shit out of him on the ground. You put my arm over him. You wake up the ref. I get the one, two, three count, and then you go on beating his ass. Now, when I come to, I'm torn. I'm torn. That's my brother. So I hit you with something, I run you off, and they get to go off into the sunset and do whatever he's going to do. But you and I get to pull a double turn. I'm the face. You're the heel now. Nobody's going to see it coming. Big Jim says he doesn't want anybody to boo him. He doesn't know about nobody else, but he loves playing a good man. Walking around town, pretending to be a good, better man helps him be a better man. Fake it till you make it mentality. Jack says that people are going to boo him for a little bit because they see themselves in him. They see somebody who makes a mistake and is trying to get it right. But eventually you're going to turn back. People need to believe we can do better, that we can fix ourselves. Do you understand? Big Jim hits Jack with a swerve of the night and says he's retiring after tonight. Baby's coming and Melly doesn't get what we get out of it. If he stops wrestling, maybe he can get more shifts at work. Maybe become a manager. Plus, she says it's dangerous anyways. He loves it. He loves to wrestle. He actually goes up to the water tower to think about how he was going to tell Jack. Jack is quiet. Big Jim says he will still turn heel tonight if that's what Jack needs. Jack says, no, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Big Jim asks for a huge favor. He says not to tell Ace. He will overthink this. They know how he is. Big over sinkers. Next scene. A still hasn't shown up to sign autographs at his table and there's a line waiting for him now. Instead, he walks into Jack's office and tells Jack he really wants to win tonight. His finish is good. It's really going to work. Jack asks, is it his finish or is it Crystal's finish? Ace tells Jack that after he makes it big, he can come back and help out the DWL and the family. Jack assures that if Ace makes it big, he will never see Duffy again until he has to bring him home to bury him. Ace says he just wants his picture on the wall next to him and his dad. Jack asks him, why are you leaving? Ace explodes with the name of one person who wouldn't. Jack says he wouldn't. They go back and forth about being happy for Ace, which he thinks Jack isn't, but Jack is happy for his brother. Ace says he's trying to figure out who's for him, who's against him, and Jack is surely against him. Jack says if he's leaving the business that he's rebuilding for everyone, is he for him or against him? Ace says it's not the same. Jack says it one more time. Are you for me or against me? They're going to have a show next Saturday whether Ace is there or not. And needs to be there to focus on the narrative for the ones that are left behind. Ace says that he wants to win the belt tonight. They're that started. You got it. I deserve it. Why the hell you have to make all the decisions? Jack says because one way or another, Dad left him in charge. And Ace needs to admit there's been a mild distribution of effort and responsibility around this here part. This, these here parts, you know, these here parts. That's how he said it. Ace explodes with, because you never let anyone do anything for to help you, Jack. Just because I don't play any, uh, just because I don't put any of my words or feelings the way you do, don't mean what I want ain't fair. What did he just say? <laughs> they both stare at the window to the crowd chanting Ace's name. They heard him yell. Ace asks if this is because he made Thomas smile at church or because he cheers for him in the ring and they all cheer for him like they're doing it right now and Jack says no. They cheer for the character. Ace says the character that he plays. Jack says the character that he created and don't keep the fans waiting. Ace pushes Jack and walks away. Jack looks outside Ace going to the table, brushing past Crystal and picking up Thomas. Crystal tries to belong, but instead she turns around and walks away. She, we see her going into the men's locker room and trying to fix her makeup, but it's stopped by Willie, who reminds her again that the locker rooms are for wrestlers and not valets. Again, Crystal is looking for somewhere to belong. She tells Willie that she is not just a valet. She can wrestle, too. Willie tells Crystal that she herself belongs here, but Crystal doesn't. Take that for the compliment that it is. Crystal leaves and does her makeup in the women's restroom with all the female fans going in and out, bumping into her. The show starts... And we see a montage of the wrestling matches. While anyone who knows what love is will understand by Irma Thomas plays over them. Rooster and Bobby Penn do their entrances. Diego Conn missed downing over his opponent. 
Bobby landing a clean elbow drop on Rooster. Ace doing his guyliner and fisting his best friend Jimmy. Fist bumps. Not fisting. Fist bumps. There's also a montage of other wrestlers standing by for their battle royal. And blink and you'll miss it. Bullet Club member Luke Gallows is seen right next to Diego. Stacy goes backstage where Jack is adjusting his championship belt and staring at his father's picture in front of the wall champions. They have a little talk before he goes out to defend his title. Back in the ring, Jimmy has just won the battle royal and is celebrating in the ring, blowing kisses at his wife. Stacy kisses Jack and tells him to be safe, but he wants to know on what he decided for the finish. Jack says it don't matter because it ain't real. Back in the ring, Jim, Big Jim continues to celebrate his final match, his retirement match. He is in tears at all the cheers he is getting. Crystal gets the gorilla position at the same time as Ace. She asks him if he's taking her with him when he leaves Duffy, but he doesn't say a word to her. She walks away and Jack arrives. They are both standing there waiting for their theme music. Ace says, fuck the belt. I already won. I go wrestle the match of my life, and it's like you said, I get to leave and you stay here forever till you end up killing yourself like Dad. Oof. Damn, that hit right there. Jack grabs a hold of Ace's neck, and Ace does the same thing to Jack. They both grabbing each other's neck. Apocalypse runs over to them and breaks them up, just in time for Big Jim to show up, and group hugs them both. Big Jim and Apocalypse celebrate, leaving Jack and Ace behind. The first song to hit is Jack's theme, and it's exactly what it's called by Sean Segal. Jack goes down to the ring to a chorus of booze. The fog machine, machine seemed to work. Such a basic walk to the ring with the championship belt around his weight. Even his son Thomas is booing him. The crowd starts an ace chant and everyone's waiting for their hero to come out and out. Run to the lightning by Coins of the Miners plays over the speakers again and out runs Ace with the 4x4 and Crystal, his ballet, right behind him, getting the crowd hyped up as well. He jumps on the top rope, raises the wood and pretends to take a shot at Jack. He hands the wooden board to Crystal, does a moonsault, and lands on his feet. This match has been hyped since last week. The lights come back on. Willie and the other wrestlers watch the match from Gorilla Precision. The crowd is on their feet. Apocalypse even says it's going to be awesome. Two different footages happen. Jack in the middle of the ring holding the belt in the air, ready to start the match. And Jack in his office in front of the computer typing up the match. Jack turns around to drop the belt in his corner. Eighth turns around to his corner to address his fans. Jack runs toward his ace. German suplexes him and immediately applies an armbar wrench while Danny the referee looks on to check on Ace who is riding in actual pain. Jack is really hurting him. Danny whispers to Jack that he's going to hurt him and Jack says he knows so Danny better call for the fucking bell. Danny looks up at Jack again. Ace is hurting. The other wrestlers are confused as well as Willie. Danny looks on and calls for the bell. While Ace has tears in his eyes, the bell is rung, the match is over, the crowd is dead silent. Thomas drops his popcorn. Kid about to cry. Stacy holds him close. You can hear a pin drop. The crowd is confused. Wild Bill, who was watching from the rafters, even disgusted. Jack grabs his belt back, looks on at his brother, who is holding his arm, and Ace just punches him in the face and out of the ring. That was the most fucked up finish ever. Everyone begins to boot chanting that this show sucked. They want their money back. People start throwing their drinks and garbage in the ring right at Ace who kneels down kneels down and starts to cry. Crystal's outside not knowing what to do but she too feels bad about this. Jack is seen walking towards the back with a big welt over his face and Wild Bill is seen leaving. The show ends with Jack slowly doing the walk of shame towards the back with people throwing garbage at him as well. And scene. 
And that's it. First episode out of eight. I'm going to enjoy doing this rewatch. The show was created by Michael Waldron, who is also a producer on Rick and Morty, showrunner on Loki, and a writer for the Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness movie. First episode of the season was directed by Peter Segal, who directed episodes for Shameless. I mentioned Stephen Amell doing the Coast to Coast at the beginning of the show, and it was the first take while filming. Amell goes on to reveal that, quote, I overshot it coast to coast on our first day of filming wrestling stuff and suffered a compression fracture and quote explained that the injury was between his mid and lower back quote I'm very fortunate and lucky that this was an injury that sounds scary but didn't require surgery it just sort of healed on its own I certainly scared a lot of people and quote said a male noting his phone blew up with people worried about the recovery including a showrunner who was planning to shift stuff around to give him ample time to recover. He said, quote, don't you worry about it because we're going to shift stuff around. We're going to write you out until Thanksgiving and then we'll take a break. Come back in the new year, he described. Quote, I was like, no, I'll see you in a couple days. Luke Hawks, who portrayed a younger version of Stone Cold Steve Austin on the Young Rock TV show, was the wrestling trainer for this entire season. I didn't pay much attention to the show when it first came out, plus it was on stars. I didn't even have it. But second viewing is pretty awesome. WWE and WCW get mentioned, which means they are canon, which maybe means that Jack Spade got the idea for what he did to his brother from the Montreal screw job. So, what did y'all think of the episode? Did you watch it? If not, and you heard this episode, and you will surely hear a lot more episodes about this show, are you curious to watch it? Let me know. I actually enjoyed it. I'm giving this episode a 10 uh, Daddy Juice Boots <laughs> out of 10 so far. Uh, I just called it Daddy Juice Boots. Let's go. Um, that's going to do it for the show. Follow us on our socials and support us from Under the Apron on Instagram, Spotify, and YouTube. Apron underscore stories on the Twitter and support us now on the Patreon. You can support us there and at the end of the broadcast I will shout you out on every episode. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash from under the apron podcast. So a big thank you to Babble B, Menace Smiling, Jolene, Miniature Dancer 51, Super Salad Kid Clips, John Decor, Unexpected Error Occurred, Seizure Queen, Purple Haze 94, Juan with the Polaroid, Brenda Lamore, Zach, WWE, Rowena, the Queen of Persia, Savage, Alaskan, Tommy the Gun, Secrets 101, my favorite DJ, it's only AA Ron, relax, Dude Board, the Wee Daddy, Princess Lynn's 420, Rabbit Orlando, Storny One, Collector of All Things Sentimental, Oh My God is Ren, K Bear, 0111, Jay Wilder, OG Just Peachy, Dimension Olympus, Songs of a Sunken Ship, California, Brabling Brook, Kush Queen, Hydrange of Water, The Grunge Witch, Hannah Time, Messenger Stupidity, DJ Crazy 76, and This Girl 474. Check out the show notes for links to other podcast trailers that you heard on this episode. Send us a message of your favorite wrestling stories, questions, comments, ratings, or requests by email. It is from under the apron at gmail.com, and I will do my best to get to them and answer accordingly. Thank you for listening. Join the live, staying the gift, and being a huge part of the community. Tell your friends. Join us next time for more stories, movies, and TV show reviews, as well as wrestling related stories when we come to you from. Snap into a Slim Jim, brother!